the Reclaimed Heirloom. My name's Christina, and this is Chalk Paint Q&A, Questions and Answers, Episode 4. Some fantastic questions I want to share with you, and hopefully I can troubleshoot some answers for you. So let's get started. Question 1, IOD Tips and Tricks. IOD is the Iron Orchid Designs Transfers. So just so you're giving a prop to what we're discussing here. So IOD, these are transfers that you can apply to decor. A lot of people are using these on furniture pieces. And just a, some quick tips um, that may not be mentioned directly on some of my uh, Saturday decorative finish tutorials, my hands-on projects that I share with you on Saturday. So tips and tricks is waxing. The trick is you don't wax before your transfer, you always have to do it after you apply the transfer. So once you've done your decorative finish, you've applied your transfer, now you can go ahead and you can wax over that, no problem. But just remember, don't wax and then apply a transfer because um, for it to adhere properly, the wax may interrupt that a little bit. So it's always really important to seal after you've applied your transfer and that will include lacquers or any other seal finish products that you're using um somebody had mentioned and it was a fantastic uh tip so thank you so much for that is to actually burnish the transfer even after you've applied it so they've given they've given you the uh plastic applicator so you're just going to rub the transfer on but once you've done that, it may be also a really good idea as well as to take a uh, clean cloth and just rub all over the transfer. This is just gonna help that adhesion of the transfer as well. So that's also a really helpful tip when working with the transfers. So that was a really good one. Um, somebody also mentioned glaze. Can I use the glaze with my chalk paints, create my deck, decorative finish and still be able to apply uh, an IOD transfer. And yes, yes you can. The glaze is not going to interrupt. Think of the glaze as the clear paint that you're using to create a, a faux finish, but it won't, there's nothing in the glaze that will interrupt the adhesion of the IOD transfer. So if you've used glaze, with chalk paint and now you still want to do an IOD transfer or any transfer. I think there's Prima Design transfers. I apologize. I don't know the name correctly, but um, any type of transfer, a decorative transfer, uh, the glaze will not interrupt that. So, and I'm talking about clear glaze. If there's an antique glaze, the antique glaze states that it is to seal your chalk paint. No. So anything that seals must be done after, but if you're using a clear um, glaze for a decorative faux finish with the chalk paint, then you're, you're good to go. So just the regular clear glaze, no, you won't have any problems. Um, question two. Question two, painting over an already painted, chalk painted piece that's been waxed. No problem, no problem at all. It's fine to change your mind. If you've painted something and you change your mind, it could be within a week, a month, a year, years later, you want to repaint that piece, no problem at all. The key in the question that was being asked is, can I paint over the wax? Now, I believe chalk paint states that you can, but for all intents purposes, just to be safe and just to put a little bit of a clarity with that, wax has an oil in it. And just to be safe, I recommend, because it's what I do, is either give it a light sand or use the TSP or something similar that's just going to remove any grease or wax off your piece. So basically you want to remove the wax. Um, you don't have to remove the chalk paint, but you want to remove any sealed product 
that's on your painted piece before you go and put a new decorative finish on it. The reason is, is because if we don't know, it's a broad question because we don't know where the piece is sitting, we don't know the climate, if it, if, if there is condensation in the air, if there is a really dry um, area it's sitting in, let's say the heat's been running and the air is really dry, you know, when you get static electrics, things like that can swell wood and it cause it to not warp, but sometimes change a little bit. And when you have a, a paint, a wax, and now a paint, you run that risk small, but you do run the risk that there may be a crack because of the oil in there and the new finish. And if it cracks, it could peel a little bit. So again, it's just to be safe and it's it takes no time at all to run a light sand, remove that wax or take that TSP and wipe that off. Um, to, to get the wax out. And if you can only get most of it off, you should be good to go. So again, it's just to protect the new finish and it really, honestly, it does take no time. I recently demonstrated, uh, I think like four or five videos um, back that I had a painted piece and now I'm gonna do a different finish on it from a year ago. And um, all, that's all I did is I used the TSP and I took it off and I put my new finish on and it's good to go. So depending on the environment that it's going to sit in, it's, it's, it's solid. I'm not worried because I sell my pieces. I don't want to have any reactive situations happen. So yes, I just recommend just giving it a buff and you're good to go. So feel free to chalk paint over a chalk painted finish. It's just the seal, that wax layer, or if you have a lacquer, again, just wanna scuff that off and don't worry about the paint itself on there. Um, you don't need to remove that to put a new finish on. Question three. Bleed through, what do I do? So I recently just posted last Saturday a video where I worked on a piece and I've never had this happen, not to that magnitude anyway, where the bleed through just was atrocious. It was like, oh my God, it was just, the, the piece was cursed. It hated me. It just, anything I wanted to do, it just wouldn't cooperate. Bleed through, just, I'm going to try to narrow this down so it's really simple here. Bleed through is only going to happen when you're dealing with real woods, number one. If you're dealing with MDF, particle boards, or veneer-like finishes, you're not really going to have bleed through per se, or you shouldn't. Um, again, it depends on the age of the piece. So just to keep it super simple, primer is great because especially with old pieces, wood or non-wood, doesn't matter, there's like little dings and marks and scratches. Primer is going to help level that. So especially when you want to have a really nice, smooth, slick, one color finish, you want everything to kind of rejuvenate and look, you know, new again. Primer is fantastic. Again, it's just going to uh, fill in those little knocks and nicks that are in the uh, furniture, regardless if it's just plain wood or veneer, etc. Um, but I've had it happen that I'll put, you know, two, three layers of primer and I will still have some bleed through. So the number one product out of all my experience that I can give to you for reference is just use shellac. If you're nervous that there is a bleed through potential, you or you already see it even when you're sanding, just use shellac. It comes in a spray. It also comes in a paint can, so you can roll it on as well. And it should be global. So no matter where you live in the world, you should be able to find shellac. So yeah, you're good to go. And um, if you think it's gonna be a real trouble piece, maybe wanna go with maybe two coats, maybe even three. But if you just are a little bit concerned, I've just put one, one coat and I'm good. But the piece that I just did, that needed a lot. And oh, that was just a nightmare, but I got through it. And I'm really proud of that because I really enjoyed the finish and 
it's it's an amazing feeling when you can rescue these pieces because the whole frame and design of that piece and you can check it out on my channel i just posted it last saturday and you know when i look at the design and the woodwork of the the overall carvings of those style furnitures and they're just beautiful so i was super happy i was able to rescue that the process was a little bit hair raising but i enjoyed it <laughs> um question four what is the best recommendation for beginner painters for a technique or best recommendation to create a decorative finish for beginners. So when I first started, you know, trying to get a little bit more creative with chalk paint, um, I have a book and I don't know, I don't think you can buy new copies, but you can buy old copies and how many are available. You can check on your Amazon. But that's where I got this book, and I got it quite a while ago. I probably got this book three years ago, like quite a while ago. But this is my Bible. This is my Bible, and it introduced me to all the fun, like, just these, it was a huge window of opportunities on different types of finishes and using different tools and et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to quickly show you that this book, which is the complete book, of decorative paint techniques. And this is where I've resourced a lot of the little finishes that you're seeing kind of come to live on my channel from the Saturday tutorials. And this is actually created by Annie Salone and Kate Gwen. So this book actually, it was probably produced I think in the 90s. So this actually was, let, let me narrow that down. This book was created before Annie Sloan started her chalk paint product because she created chalk paint and she was doing decorative finishes on furniture years before she even came out with the chalk paint brand when she created it. So going into, I feel like I was kind of going deep into Annie's historical mind and where she developed a lot of her techniques and it's it's just an excellent resource so i really recommend this book if you're looking for inspiration and you're new but you love decorative finishes it's not even just painting something just one color like you really want to take it up and find other resources and things that you want to do to create really fun techniques but my favorite and my suggestion to a new beginner trying chalk paint, but you want to do something other than just painting it one solid color is the ragging technique. And the reason I recommend that is because you can pick any two colors you want. You can even use three or four, but again, just starting with some basics, being brand new, you can start with a dark finish and rag a light color or vice versa. Ragging is nice because you're just playing with the paint and the result of what you're getting is just a beautiful faux texture look. And especially with something that has no woodwork, there's no intricate design within the furniture piece, ragging is a beautiful way to, to give it depth and kind of that 3D projection that there's a lot going on into the piece. So it's it's a great way for a beginner to start and really play around and start to create with decorative finishes. So I do recommend for that question is the ragging technique, but that's where I learned. Question five. Pricing your furniture. Again, this is gonna to pertain to people who are taking a hobby and wanting to maybe go into a business or maybe they're already into, you know, creating and redoing furniture to for a business that they already have. And pricing is a tricky question because what are you painting as far as furniture? Is this real wood furniture? Is this replicated furniture? What type of wood is it? So breaking down pricing can be a little bit stressful as well as, um, is this too high? Is it too low? And 
the thing is for me, what I price for depends on where I live. So am I in a remote area? Am I in a metropolitan area? And obviously the more populated your area is, the more supply and demand you have. So it is advantageous for you. Whereas the like a smaller populated area, it, you don't have a wide audience of buyers. So it starts to become a little bit more stressful in trying to make it appealing to, you know, coax people into buying your pieces, right? Because there's less people. So this is where somebody wanting to get into decorative finishes and what I do because I live in, I live in a small populated area, but I transport my pieces out. So it goes into a larger population. Now, breaking down the pricing, I can give you, you know, a few tips on how I do it, but everybody's a little bit different. And I hope that kind of makes a little bit of sense for you. You have to take the calculations of how much you spent in products and the amount of products. So if you have, you have a tin of wax, you're only using a portion of that. So it's the portion of the product. You have to take that number, not the actual whole product. Okay, I spent $30 for this tin of wax, but you're only using a small you know, portion of that. Same with your paints. You bought a can of paint, right? But you've only used, you know, a, a, a portion of it, regardless of the piece and size, but you've used a portion. So you can't really charge for the whole can, but you can charge for the amount that you use. So you calculate those into your finish as well. Time, you know, you have to be paid for the time it took you. Transport, the transporting of the furniture to and from where you need to go, the, you know, the mileage, the gas, that kind of thing. So you can flip furniture if you want, or you can create one of a kind pieces. And that's what I do. I create, I try to create very original, one of a kind pieces. It's not about just having an overall refreshed one color look. I really, try to get into, I wanna make each piece as unique as possible. I really wanna make each piece a, a statement piece. So I try to really get into the artistic avenue of decorative finish. And that's where I try to break down my pricing. So I take the value, okay, is it a real wood piece? Then how long it took me? the breakdown of how much of the supply and the cost of that supply amount that I used. And I calculate that in. So my pieces can range for as little, because it's a small little piece, let's say two to $300. And then when I'm starting to get into large cabinets, bigger buffets, those pieces I can sometimes charge up to twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 for. And it's also because of the amount of time and artistry I'm putting into that piece. And you have to grow, right? Like I didn't start off with these prices. I grew into them too, because people start to see your advertisement. They start to see what you do. They start to appreciate the value and the time and the artistic character you're putting into it. So you grow into it. So, the best way I can say for you is just do some homework, you know, go and ask other people in your area that may be doing, you know, restorative work, um, painting uh, projects, um, asking them, you know, what your, you know, starting prices, you know, what what is your fair aspect of the pricing? And most people are usually very, very helpful because, you know, they don't want you to ever feel like you're going to undercharge. So they're going to give you a, a true market value of what they would do. So it's really helpful. And the other thing that you can do, because we're all coming from total different areas of the globe around the world, I recommend that go to your local stockists that you're buying your chalk paint products from. So if you're using um, the Annie Sloan chalk paint, if you're using a DIY, which I think is the Debbie's Design, um, uh, I think they call it mineral paint. Um, anyhow, 
what, regardless of the chalk paint product you buy, go and speak with your stockists and you know, if you can bring some photographs from even from your phone and, and, and speak with them because they can help you because they have a store and they not only sell the paint, but they're also sh sharing and selling off things that have been painted for home decor, let it be furniture or home decor items. They would really be a great resource to helping you, you know, break some pricing down for your area. So reach out to them, you know, whether it's in person or you can give them a call on the phone and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm doing this X, Y, and Z, and this is the product I'm using, which you sell at your store. Do you have kind of a pricing way that you're going about in the area for chalk painted pieces? So I really hope that helps. And I'm so impressed with the questions and comments that you guys are doing with this Chalk Paint 101 and I can't thank you enough. Please, if you have any questions, I really want to make the Chalk Paint 101 a fantastic resource to help troubleshoot and get you the answers to your chalk paint projects that will help you be successful with your decorative finishes. So thank you so much for joining me in Chuck Paint 101, episode four. And if you have questions, please leave me a comment in the comment box below. I'm gonna see you next Wednesday for Chuck Paint 101 Q&A, episode five. Don't forget to leave me a comment as well as hit the subscribe button and you'll be able to see my Saturday tutorials where I do a hands-on project with chalk paint and creating a decorative finish. Thank you so much for joining me and we're gonna see you soon.